in mid-June, a couple of months ago, neo-Nazis held rallies in Florida, including outside of Disneyland. And two months later, after that, in August, a white supremacist terrorist invaded a store a couple of hours away from, from Disney World and murdered three African Americans. The killer's AR-15 rifle was dotted with swastikas. Then, just last week, neo-Nazis, you can see there, rallied again in Florida. About 50 gathered on a freeway overpass. They were uniformed in black and red outfits, shirts emblazoned on the back with the letters 88, signifying the eighth letter in the English alphabet, H, and thus symbolizing Heil Hitler. Flashing Hitler salutes, they chanted, Jews will not replace us. It was the same chant that we heard in 2017. In August of 2017, in Charlottesville, Virginia, neo-Nazis raised that same chant during a torchlight march on the University of Virginia. The following day, during the infamous Unite the Right rally, Confederate flags and, yes, actual Nazi flags were once again unfurled. As, as we all know, that rally ended in a riot with one person who had opposed the takeover of her streets by Nazism actually being run over with a car and killed. Now what does all of this have to do with ethno-nationalism in India, you, you may be asking. Well, at Charlottesville in 2017, that day, there were, there were two key figures there, Richard Spencer, and Daniel Freiberg, and you can see Daniel Freiberg pictured there on the, on the far right, quite appropriately, on the, on the lower picture. Earlier in 2017, uh, Daniel Freiberg uh, had partnered with Richard Spencer to co-found an organization called the, the Alt-Right Corporation, a media outlet to propagate white supremacist ideology. Freiberg, however, already had his own company, Arctos Media, which is the world's largest distributor of far-right literature. Arctos Media was originally founded in India. Living there, Freiburg used the opportunity to network with India's own ethno-nationalists just mere months before they rose to national power in 2014. In, in late 2013, he sat down with several state and national leaders of the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, which he described as India's Hindu traditional conservative party. They discussed book projects, as well as similarities and possibilities of cooperation. And he also met with the national spokesperson of the Rashtriya Swayamsevak Sangh, the RSS, which he called a grassroots Hindu nationalist organization. Arctos intends to become the Indian rights gateway into the Western world, declared his company. So, as arguably the world's leading white supremacist publisher sat down with leaders from the RSS BJP, maybe we should ask, what exactly is the RSS BJP? Founded in 1925, the RSS is an all-male armed uniform paramilitary organization which today boasts approximately 6 million members across India. It is devoted to the ideology of Hindu nationalism, which holds that India is, always has been, and always must be a land of Hindus and only of and for Hindus. The RSS is the parent organization of the BJP. In 2014, the BJP gained national power in India. And when the BJP was re-elected in 2019, around 75%, 75% of its national cabinet members came directly from an RSS background, including, of course, Prime Minister Narendra Modi himself. The RSS is the world's oldest, largest, and fastest growing <coughs> fascist movement. And as the RSS BJP, it controls the most populated country in the world, India. To understand why white supremacists today might be interested in the RSS, let's journey back almost a hundred years, around the time that the RSS came into being. The Nazi party 
was founded in Germany in 1920, and the National Fascist Party was founded in Italy in 1921. Back in India, in 1923, a man named Savarkar published a manifesto detailing his core ideology of Hindutva, Hindu nationalism. Back in Germany, in 1925, Hitler published his, man his manifesto, Mein Kampf, and founded the Schutzstaffel, or SS. Back in India, that same year, a group founded the RSS to advance Hindutva, Hindu nationalism. Well, these different ethno-nationalist movements in Europe and in the Indian subcontinent were all taking root within a few years of each other. They developed a mutual fascination, admiration, and inspiration for each other. From India, the founding fathers of the RSS all pointed to Italian and German fascism as an example of what they wanted to replicate in India. The biggest difference was that for the fascists in India, their enemies were, were not Jews, but rather Christians and Muslims. Looking at Nazi Germany, for instance, Savarkar on the top there praised it, praised Nazi Germany for reviving Aryan culture and waging a crusade against the enemies of, of Aryan culture. Nazi treatment of the Jews, he argued, showed how the majority has the right to drive out a minority. Indian Muslims, he said, should be treated just like German Jews. Munji, next to Savarkar, was a co-founder of the RSS who actually visited fascist Italy. And after touring the militias and even meeting Mussolini, the dictator, Munji praised the idea of fascism for bringing out the conception of unity amongst people. India, he argued, should imitate the fascist organizations in both Italy and Germany. However, he declared that the good news was that this imitation was already occurring in the form of the RSS. Munji's protege, Hegevar, became the first supreme chief of the RSS. And looking over at Nazi Germany, he said that the RSS's goal was to keep India a country of Hindus, just like Germany is a country of Germans. Galvarkar, the second supreme chief of the RSS, was obsessed with race spirit and racial consciousness, which he saw rising in Germany and Italy. He insisted that the European fascists were demonstrating the right to define nationality by race, and that they had proved how every race possesses the indisputable right of excommunicating from its nationality all who have turned traitors by entertaining aspirations different from those of the national race. In Galvarkar's eyes, those traitors to the national race especially included Christians and Muslims in India. They were foreign elements and internal threats to the nation. And so what to do with them? For a solution, Galvarkar looked over to Nazi Germany. To keep up, he said, to keep up the purity of the race and its culture, Germany shocked the world by her purging the country of the Semitic races, the Jews, said Galvarkar. Applauding that as the highest manifestation of race pride, he concluded that Germany had set a good example by showing how it is supposedly impossible for different races and cultures to be assimilated into one united whole. And thus, he concluded that the Nazi policy towards the Jews was a good lesson for us in Hindustan to learn and profit by was something that should be implemented in India. It was not, however, just a, a one-way gaze with these Indians looking over at the European fascists. At the same time, at the same time, that the RSS was modeling itself after the fascists in Europe, those fascists in Europe were often infatuated with some of the worst aspects of South Asian culture and history. Caste, for instance, was a big one. Heinrich Himmler, 
head of the SS and architect of the Holocaust. After being introduced to a book which argued, a book which argued that failure to fully follow the caste system in India led to racial impurity and thus to India's decline, Himmler concluded that salvation came from becoming a Kshatriya, the high caste warriors of the caste system. Alfred Rosenberg, next to Mr. Himmler there. Alfred Rosenberg, one of the leading Nazi philosophers, also looks to the caste system in the Indian subcontinent as inspiration for an ideal social model. Praising how Indo-Aryans separated themselves with the institution of caste, Rosenberg said it allowed them to link themselves to an quote-unquote acceptable image of the human type and so to create a gulf between themselves and, in his words, inferior groups. The caste concept, he concluded, created a worldview which for depth and range cannot be surpassed by any philosophy even today. And then in Italy, fascist Italy, philosopher Julius Evola similarly pointed to the caste system as his ideal for a social, for a social model. Evola, who influenced Mussolini's racial policies to, to swing towards Aryanism, was also linked to Nazi Germany. And, and one historian writes that Evola's ideal, his ideal was the Indo-Aryan tradition, where hierarchy, caste, authority, and state ruled supreme over the material aspects of life. And then from France, there was Savitri Devi, known today as Hitler's priestess. In 1932, this was the year after, after RSS co-founder Munji had toured fascist Italy, Savitri Devi, she moved to India, uh, where she quickly published a book warning Hindus about the need to, quote, recover along with their national consciousness their military virtues of old to re-become a military race. The way to do that, she said, should be the organization of the young men in pledge-bound military-like batches with Hindu nationalism as their only ideal. Her book acknowledges both Munji and Savarkar as inspirations the forward to her book is by Savarkar's brother, who was an RSS co-founder. Now, spending years in India, she married a man from the top caste. She started publishing a Nazi magazine, began spying for the Axis powers during World War II, and toured the region preaching about how Hitler was supposedly the, the new incarnation of Vishnu. She often sprinkled her lectures, she said, with quotations from Mein Kampf. Savitri Devi wasn't very well known outside of India until, according to a historian, her writings first came to prominence among the American neo-Nazis. Today, some of Arctos Media's, remember Arctos Media, that white supremacist publishing house founded in India, some of their most heavily promoted books are republications of books by Julius Ebola, the Italian fascist, for instance, or books by Savitri Devi, Hitler's priestess. Meanwhile, interconnections between Western fascism and Indian fascism go, go deeper still. Since its origins, the RSS has been violent. Pogroms, assassinations, terrorist bombings, lynchings, and more are the RSS's modus operandi. Usually against Muslims, but often also including uh, going against Christians and even others, including Hindus, as in the case of Mohandas Gandhi, who was assassinated by an RSS member. Interestingly, the RSS's violence has, has not escaped the notice of white supremacists uh, in the West. In 2011, in Norway, 
Neo-Nazi terrorist Anders Breivik murdered 77 people in one day because he said he was trying to save the racially distinctive character of the Aryans and stop the Islamization of Europe. In his lengthy manifesto, Breivik writes glowingly about the policy of right-wing Hindu nationalism or Hindutva which seeks to make the Indian state into a Hindu nation. These are the words of a Norwegian white supremacist terrorist looking over and praising the rise of Hindu nationalism of Hindutva. Praising the RSS, Breivik notes in his words, they, the RSS, dominate the streets and often riot and attack Muslims. The RSS, he says, needs to consolidate and strike to win. Speaking of white nationalists and Hindu nationalists, he concludes, talking about white nationalists and Hindu nationalists, he concludes, our goals are more or less identical. And he insists it, it is essential for both movements to learn from each other and to cooperate as much as possible. For its part, Arctos Media, the white supremacist publishing company, has certainly seemed interested in mutual learning and cooperation with the RSS in years, and even within a couple of years after this gentleman's attack. In 2013, Arctos Media published a book by a white American convert to Hinduism named Frank Morales, noting that basically everything, and this is, this is a book written by a white man who converted to Hinduism. His book is published by Arctos Media, which is the distributor, the largest distributor in the world of far-right literature. In this book which they published, the author notes that basically everything about the RSS's style and structure was directly appropriated from the newly emerging nationalist, that is, fascist movements that were sweeping the European continent during the 1920s. Morales details a 10-point plan of improvement which he recommends for the RSS to adopt. And topping the list is that the RSS must annihilate the immediate existential threat from communist terrorists, Islamic jihadists, and Christian missionaries in India. Now, soon after publishing this book, Arctos founder Daniel Freiberg began his meetings with the RSS BJP leadership, which I talked about at the outset of this, of this speech. So what should we make of all of this? Well, in 2014, the BJP came to power, and they didn't, however, do it alone. You see, the RSS is the mother organization of a whole family of Hindu nationalist groups. Outside of India, that family includes the RSS's international wing, the Hindu Swayam Sabak Sangh, or HSS. And leading up to India's general election in 2014, Leaders in the U.S. wing of the HSS and related groups mobilized to help to put the BJP into power. They organized massive phone banks around the U.S. to call voters in India and urge them to vote for the BJP. Then they also sent thousands of volunteers back to India from America to serve as boots on the, on the ground physically campaigning for the BJP. Well, now that the BJP is securely ensconced in Delhi, the RSS's affiliates, like the HSS, here in America, have much more time on their hands to focus on issues closer to home. Issues like this, for instance, issues like visiting local city and county governments to present the HSS, that is the U.S. wing of the RSS, as the go-to representatives of the Indian American community for the city council to be in touch with, or demanding that local governments welcome the HSS into their chambers to award them resolutions praising them as an outstanding cultural organization, or pressuring local governments, as they tried in Seattle in 2020, not to speak about human rights violations in India, or pressuring state governments to alter educational curriculum for children to insert 
and or delete materials about India which are in line with the Hindu nationalist narrative. Issues too, like the HSS inviting members of U.S. Congress to speak at their events, or propping up political candidates and elected officials at state and federal levels, doing it because those candidates are favorable to the Hindu nationalist agenda, or getting their own people directly into positions of power. Such as happened last year when a member of the board of directors for HSS USA was appointed as an advisor to the Department of Homeland Security. Meanwhile, the Hindu nationalist movement across India is exploding as the RSS BJP, nine years into its iron grip on power and almost assuredly in line to win the upcoming 2024 general elections, has brought the country to the brink of what international experts are warning is an impending genocide. We've all said so many times, never again, as was said after the Holocaust, but the question today in context of India is what can we do to prevent it from happening again? Here's a little bit of what. Indian citizens are no longer free to dissent. Criticizing the Modi regime today, especially if you're a religious minority, is a great way to get yourself criminally charged, imprisoned, lynched, or even disappeared. Yeah. Indians can no longer speak freely in India, but we can do so here in America. We have the freedom and the greater degree of safety necessary to easily speak out against fascism in India from right here in America. And as we speak out against fascism in India, one of the most effective ways to do so is by exposing the truth that the RSS, the violent Hindu nationalist paramilitary which controls India, has direct historical connections to the original European fascists and is in the present day a source of inspiration for white supremacists in the West. The Hindu nationalism and white nationalism share so much in common, they're, they're kissing cousins, if you will, is deeply troubling. But it also offers an opportunity to bolster the fight against both. The struggles against white nationalism and Hindu nationalism are intertwined. To make progress against Hindu nationalism, we need to spread awareness about just how closely those two ideologies are interconnected, which can only help in creating the types of broad anti-fascist coalitions which are going to be crucial to achieving victory in this struggle. From here in America, one key step to achieving that victory is to expose and oppose the RSS's U.S. affiliates. Groups like the HSS are an extremely important support base for the Modi regime, both in terms of help, having helped put it in office in the first place, as well as in terms of ongoing propagandizing for it in the U.S. right now. Here in America, the single most potentially effective thing we can do to halt the rise of fascism in India is to topple its pillar of support here in the U.S. So with that said, let's put a stop to nationalists, white, Hindu, or of any variety, dominating our streets, both here and in India. Thank you.